one week left in the legislative session, and we're here on This Week in Missouri Politics. I want to jump right in with somebody who's right in the center of everything, Representative Robert Cornell. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back, Scott. Always good to be here. Finally, we don't have all these other three people bugging us, and we can just talk. You know, <laughs> yeah. we don't have to have all these people interjecting. So the House, I, every year, somebody probably has the upper hand in the budget fight. Gosh, it looks like the House came out of things looking very good this year. you got to be proud. Absolutely. You know, we passed a balanced budget with no new taxes. And one of the big things with our, our budget chairman right out of the gate, uh, start a session this year, he said, you know, one of his top priorities is fully funding the education formula. Uh, that's mission accomplished there. That's something that is a huge part of our of our budget there, uh, as well as, you know, the governor made a recommendation uh, with the point system with the elderly uh, of how, whether they get in-home health care or not. Uh, there's a matrix point system that, you know, he wanted to go up to 27, which would have really put some people at, at mm -hmm. disadvantage. We were able to walk that back and uh, lower the point system back to where it currently is. Were you surprised the Senate went along with you fully funding the formula? I mean, they didn't do it traditionally. Yeah, you know, there, that was going to be a, a point of contention, but uh, during some floor debate, uh, once the Senate got the budget out of committee onto the floor, mm -hmm. uh, there was a floor amendment offered up w w to fully fund it and take the House position. It passed, so obviously as a House, we're, we're happy to see that. <laughs> what else uh, What else is uh, good for the folks in, in your district that the budget got funded besides the foundation formula? Yeah, you know, um, you know, part of that fully funding the, the foundation formula is a uh, couple years ago we passed and I voted for. Uh, once the foundation formula is fully uh, funded, it then kicks in uh, early childhood education, uh, which is yeah. really big out in my area. Uh, you know, a lot of people my age, you know, younger generation with kids that, you know, I've got a four and a half year old and a three year old. Early childhood education is really big. And now that program's really going to start to take off as well. I think there was a lot of things that, that were predicated upon fully funding the formula, probably because yeah. folks thought you'd never fully fund the formula. And now that you Absolutely. have, I mean, it, it really changes the landscape on some of the education reform stuff as well. Absolutely. You know, earlier this session, the House passed a, an expansion of charter schools. It's sitting mm -hmm. over in the Senate. Hopefully we can get some movement on that. But one of the things that was put in that charter bill was that none of that would even kick into effect unless the foundation formula was fully funded. And again, now that we've accomplished that, now we can look at a possibly expanding charter schools if the Senate moves on it. Let's talk about something else that was talked about a lot early in session, uh, reducing regulations. Uh, the first time you've mm -hmm. had a Republican executive with these Republican supermajorities, the governor mm -hmm. made a priority to reduce regulations. One that's been talked about that you're talking about reducing is one on the sale of alcohol. Absolutely. You know, I think you know, everybody's all excited about some of the big sexy things like tort reform, mm -hmm. labor reform, education reform, but one of the things that I've always kind of been I'm not one to try to grab headlines. I kind of work in the background and some of that stuff that's still on, you know, when people go door to door and hand out their literature as a Republican, still on there, reducing regulations, reducing the size of government. Uh, and that, those are the kinds of things I've been concentrating on. For example, one bill that seemed to be making a, a lot of noise in the press was uh, there's been a lawsuit that's been going on for a few years that says currently under current law, um, if a retail location wants to promote and advertise the fact that it has a, a loyalty program, discounts, coupons, rebates, any of those, they're prohibited from being able to actually truthfully advertise that to the consumers. Mm -hmm. And so a consumer doesn't know what's actually going on inside the store. And I think by reducing, taking that regulation out, which restricts free speech, you know, somebody's being able to truthfully advertise what's going on in their store, consumers, it helps benefit the consumer because they know the actual price of, and being able to compare without actually having to physically go into the Does store. that happen? Absolutely. Um, so you get it done you know, this session, you think? I think there, there's a couple opportunities left, uh, depending mm -hmm. on if the log jam can break in the Senate. Uh, uh, never say never. It's been an interesting session, but let's, uh, as we wind down, let's talk about next session. Uh -huh. There's been a lot of talk about you running for leadership in the House. Do you plan to seek leadership next session? Yeah, you know, that's something that, you know, Five months out of the year, I go down to Jefferson City and I leave behind my wife, my three children, my businesses that I run. Um, so when I do go down to Jefferson City, I, I try to be as impactful as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been having some talks with some of my house colleagues there. And from Springfield to St. Joseph, Bowling Green down to the Boot Hill, I've got support um, that not happy with the current options that are available to run for speaker. Uh, so I think very soon here, you're gonna be seeing an announcement coming forward. Well, best people wanting you to run for speaker, correct? Uh, that has been talked about, and like yeah. I said, there will probably be an announcement here in the next few days. So let's talk a little about the last week of session. You know, it is uh, a lot of attention has been on the Senate. It's got to be a little challenging in the House because you don't have Senate bills because they haven't passed that many Correct. as in a normal session. But as a Republican, well, fewer laws, more freedom, right? That's what we hear at Lincoln Day. Absolutely. So, you know, that's something that, you know, the last couple of years, we've kind of 
gotten to this showdown with the House versus the Senate mm -hmm. uh, as far as, you know, whether the Senate's able to, to kick out uh, bills and pass some of the House priorities. So over the past few years, these last couple weeks of session, the House has been stuck with, well, either we got to strip off all of our House language and, and try to pass just pass the Senate version as is, or is the House going to have some say in what, what gets to the governor's desk? And so the past few years, we've been stripping off the House priorities to let the Senate stuff get through. And I think, uh, as you see with my caucus, it's starting to get a little frustrating. And so now we're starting to add on these House priorities onto these Senate bills that the few that are over there, add on the House priorities and, and send it back to the Senate and say, it, it's your turn. Let's talk about the thing that the Senate's held up on is this dark money. It's this uh, for folks watching, if you can tell who the donors are, it's considered a normal pack or a committee in the light because yeah. it's transparent. When mm -hmm. the donors are kept secretive and you don't know who's contributing to it, it's called dark money. Yep. Uh, the senators have stepped up and said, we're going to regulate this in the state of Missouri, try to run out some of the Washington people and the East Coast folks mm -hmm. out of Missouri politics. If they do get that to a vote, most think, I mean, who's going to vote for dark money? Yeah. What happens with that in the House? Yeah, you know, I would assume most likely it'll probably come to the House General Laws Committee, which I'm the chairman of. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the top policy committee uh, in the House. Uh, some of the earlier ethics bills came through there. Uh, and in the past, I have filed bills to deal with uh, dark money contributions uh, and influence in politics. However, I've, over the last year or so, I've kind of walked back from that position. When I start to realize that what we're doing there with, with that, it, the devil's in the details. Do we really want to create another government-run database full of political donors when we see some of the things that the IRS has done with conservative groups and going after some of these conservative groups and, and attacking them simply because they are conservative. Uh, so, you know, to create a government-run database uh, where all of a sudden now, if you've contributed to the NRA, Missouri Right to Life, the Vitae Society, now that's going to be public information. I, I think that's something that we really need to look at the details. And that's where the saying comes, the devil's in the details. And But I'm so more than happy to, they, more, more than open for that discussion. You're saying the House might protect the dark money folks? I'm saying that it's going to be an interesting discussion. And again, we'll have to see what's actually in the details. But, you know, again, never say never. We can always, still got a week left to pass something. There's been a lot of talk that the House is, um, the House uh, flies pretty close to the governor on most things. Do you think he'll come and twist your arm and say he wants to keep his money? Uh, the governor hasn't ever been to my office so <laughs> I, I more than more doors always open more than happy to talk with them but uh you know the house is its own separate body we're a separate branch of government and, and we'll certainly take his uh, thoughts into consideration just like every one of my constituents let's talk about a a, uh, a bill that is over in the house the education reform bill that senator canning moved mm -hmm. where's that at and does it get across yeah so we had a the house general laws committee hearing again which i chair we had a hearing on that and voted it out on monday uh, so now it's sitting in our rules committee, and I believe that's noticed up to be voted out Monday. Uh, mm -hmm. So then once it's voted out of the rules committee, it then goes onto the full floor for debate by the whole House. Uh, and so far, it's clean. We haven't had any, added any House amendments to it. So there is that possibility that if, if no amendments get added onto the floor, it could go to the governor's desk. Uh, but then again, I, I think there's going to be some spirited debate because it, it does take in quite a few things. It's not just you know one issue. I think it's about two or three separate different issues all bundled together as one. The House has been pretty predictable this year, and as long as there's been water flowing past that Capitol, mm -hmm. the Senate has came over and said, you have to take our bills, we can't get them back through, D take them like they are, yeah. and try to and force the House to do that. This year, uh, it may be more valid than ever that it probably, if you send legislation back over there, it ends up dying. Yeah. Do you think that that works this year, or do you stand up and say, well, okay, the public's safe, we'll all go home? Yeah, you know, I think if, if you look at what the, the General Assembly for this year has already done with passing a balanced budget again, keeping mm -hmm. our AAA bond rating. We've passed right to work. We've passed a uh, prohibition on p public labor agreements, you know, some of the labor reform things. We've passed, um, you know, a, lo a lot of tort reform bills, uh, you know, such as expert witness, time limited demands. This has already been a historical General Assembly. I think Assembly. you could make the argument. I think you could stand beside the Speaker and the Governor and say this is the best session in the history of the Republican Party in the state of Missouri, at least Absolutely. for 50 years, if you did nothing else. But but I guess now that the budget's done. I mean, I, I think it's an interesting thing. People get caught up in the number of bills in the last week, but I think yeah. you can look people in the eye and say this is the best session Republicans have ever had. Absolutely. You know, I, I, every member of the House and every member of the Senate cares about their bill and wants to get their yeah. bill done. But absolutely, I think what you're saying is 100% correct. If, if we were to end session tomorrow or, or Monday, this is a historical session with the Missouri General Assembly, one that I'm proud of. 
and I'm proud of my speaker, and I'm proud of the Senate and the governor. Representative Cordell, we hope you'll come back and talk about it with us as we move through your speaker's race and in the next session. All right, thank you for having me. We'll be right back with our Opinion Maker panel. Mindy Mazur's back to join us right after this. My name is Eric Phillippe. I'm a veteran, a carpenter, and a father. When Eric Greitens said he was going to change politics as usual, folks like me didn't think the first thing he'd do as governor was take dead aim at our jobs and our families' livelihoods by working to repeal prevailing wage. Call Governor Greitens. Tell him to protect prevailing wage and to protect my family, not destroy it. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. Nobody likes power outages, including us. That's why Ameren Missouri is investing in new equipment and smarter technology to reduce outages and keep pace with future needs. And it's working. We're in the top 25% in the nation for reliability. And on average, our rates are 18% lower than other Midwestern states. Making sure the power is there when you need it. That's energy at work. Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back to this week in Missouri Politics. We're joined by Sam Gladney, rising star of the Democrat Party. Maybe candidate? Maybe? Uh, could be. I'm thinking about could it. Could be. Mindy Mazur, welcome back. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Greg Keller, the guy that makes me stand in my closet and be intimidated about what I'm going to wear when you're on the show. Welcome <laughs> back, sir. Thank you for having me. Aaron Baker with Action Strategies, welcome back, sir. Good to be here. Education, uh, the, the thing in the budget, I think there's all, the budgets are always challenging to talk about. This one, though, is not. It has a education funding for the first time ever fully funded. What do you think? Scott Fitzpatrick did a really good job of leading yeah. this effort, really a rising star in our party and, and a, a, a representative of kind of a young libertarian uh, style. Uh, of course, Senator Brown right there helping him as well, kind of representing the base of the party. Uh, putting together a budget that fully funds public education uh, for the first time in a long time. And uh, we'll wait and see if, if school groups actually thank Republican legislators for that. I wouldn't yes, hold my breath. But that's an interesting thing. Greg Keller, you'll see that when there's a, a voucher measure or something that won't affect any rural school district probably ever, there's tons of emails, and rightly so, that's right. But we'll see if there's the same appreciation for fully funding the formula. Yeah, school choice really tends to drive the Democrats in this state nuts, unfortunately. We'd love to see, obviously, an opportunity for kids across the state to have access to better educations. But sometimes the Democrat Party is just too enthralled with the teachers' unions for I that. I think it's a very important. There's teachers that vote Republican. But I think you see some of the outspokenness on some of these other structural think, issues. When fully funding the formula is something that Republicans deserve praise for if you're a teacher, right? I think that's why it's such a shame that you see the Democrat Party in such lockstep unison with the, the teachers unions because you see Republican legislators in Jefferson C City showing that they can fully fund our school and manage the levers of government effectively like they did this week. Mindy Mays, there's an interesting thing. I mean, I, I do think it's Bruce Frank sat in that chair and said something that struck home to me talking about vouchers. He's like, well, they don't even fund the formula. This is how much money they say it takes to run the schools. And then they complain they don't perform well. We'll fund them for a few years and see. Well, now they're funding them for a few years. Well, I think at the end of the day, people are going to look at the budget this year, and yes, there were some definitely some good things that happened in terms of funding it at a higher level, but there are some real concerns with vouchers and, and also the fact that they're not really tested at this point, and making sure that each student in Missouri has an equal opportunity to a good education is what it's supposed to be about. You know, Sam, I, I find it interesting that Republicans want to tell folks in North St. Louis County how to run their school districts. Can you imagine if folks in North St. Louis County came and told folks in West Butler County how to run their school district? Absolutely. Um, pe people in West Butler County would be pretty upset about that, as they should be. Um, I think supporting teachers and supporting students growing in classrooms is an important priority. Uh, it's a good thing it got funded now, and let's, uh, let's keep that progress uh, moving forward. But I'm a strong supporter of teachers, and I don't think vouchers are a good idea. How big a deal is this on the campaign trail? If you're a Republican state senator running for re-election, to come back and say we fully funded education? For the first time. 
I think it's a matter of uh, what happens next. Um, if they stay with it and if they continue to support teachers and, and students learning in classrooms, um, then that's something I think everybody can get behind. If they don't, then they're going to be held accountable for it. Mindy, you talk to a lot of folks. I, I wonder if this is something that moves somebody that would that would generally not vote Republican to continue to vote to think of Repu voting for Republican because they fully funded the formula. Does this penetrate through to an education person? Uh, I don't know. I think we're a little bit in the weeds in terms of the average voter here. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Education and funding public education really shouldn't be a partisan issue at the end of the day. Aaron Bragg, your long list of Republican clients in the state of Missouri, does, does this make the flyer or is it still guns, taxes, and abortion? You know, I think it helps for a, a teacher in rural Missouri or, or the suburbs who, who are worried about entitlement programs and see, the, see problems with just culture in their classrooms. This is going to be another reason for them to continue to vote for Republicans. We had color to Republicans make this an issue they can run on, or does it just go back to the guns, taxes, and abortion? Oh, no, I, I think that the Republicans are starting to put together a nice story here that under Governor Greitens and these super majorities that Republicans have in Jefferson City, that they're getting priority things done for Missouri across a whole range of issues. I think this is a great issue for Republicans. And most importantly, it's one that if we're effective on it as Republicans, I think you see us maybe wresting control on this issue away from Democrats, which is a big, big, big problem for them. Already getting ambitious, aren't you? Uh, time, will, time will tell <laughs> yeah. on that. Time will tell on that. Minnie Mazur, I, I, there was this piece in the Missouri Times where it talked about the governor's 10 best days. And my gosh, I mean, these are 10 days for a Republican that would be great to have over two years. I mean, it's hard to have scripted a better start to his term. And then there was the five, the five bad days. And they were almost all unforced errors, kind of centering around this dark money committee that's tied up the Senate now. Um, I, you know, I kind of think he may pivot, right, and just say that this is not worth it. Well, he's pretty good at pivoting. But that said... Who would have thought maybe a year ago that Eric Greitens would be the poster child for dark money? I mean, he ran on a campaign of cleaning up dark money That's why and, it's such and a big transparency. Issue, right? It's huge. It's a, it's, it's a total, I mean, he's, now he's the do as I say, not as I do um, governor as it relates to ethics. And that's a real, real problem. You know, Sam, I, it looks to me like these things certainly aren't helping pass anything. Uh, he seems like an outcome-based guy. I mean, imagine if you're a Democrat, what his 100 days looks like without this. Well, he's certainly accomplished, a lot of legislation has been passed. It's legislation yeah. that I mostly disagree with, but you can't argue the fact that a lot of laws have been signed. Um, but some of this ethics stuff, like we've talked about, people expect their politicians to do the things that they say they're going to do. When you run championing ethics reform, and then you're doing a lot of the things that you're complaining about, people will be upset about that. And I think that may be true anytime, but I mean, I, I think it's true because anything the governor does is a big deal. But Aaron Breger, do you think it's not true that he made ethics such a big part of his campaign? He made castigating others' ethics a big part of his campaign. That's why these things get more scrutiny than they normally would. I think we have a governor that's aggressive and in getting involved in issues. And so he's also very good at fundraising. And I think that he does get a lot of scrutiny for that. I mean, Claire McCaskill has uh, dark money ads running for her right now connected to Chuck Schumer. And we don't see the traditional media around the state talking about that. Greitens is very aggressive and very good at doing this. Does she fundraise for that? Those, the, does she fundraise for the money that run those dark ads? I'm not sure how she's involved with Well, I think she should it. be I, criticized not, for that thing clearly, right? Yes, exactly. And I think it's hypocritical for Democrats to attack anyone that's using this. Money has a way of flowing into politics, and this is just a part of, of the government being Robert was just aggressive. on here, though. There's money flows into his campaign, Greg Keller, but you know who gives him money. If you care, which I believe Missourians are pretty well shown, they don't care. But if you do care, you can go look at his Robert Cornell's fundraising report. And if you want to believe he's influenced, you can see it. It's transparent. I believe Eric Rydens, if he took this money in a pack, no one would care who gave him the money. And it would be pretty much a moot point. Well, to your point, Scott, I mean, you'd be hard-pressed to find an issue that voters really care about less than campaign finance reform. I know that the people on the other side of the aisle are always trying to make this an issue. The problem is that the voters just don't care. They care about pocketbook issues. Yeah, here's, the, here's the big problem, though, with the dark money thing. It's blatantly unconstitutional and will be found as such in the courts. You see people as diverse as the ACLU and the National Rifle Association coming together on this issue saying, you know what, there should not be a government database that lists how I want to give my private money to private organizations that are not involved in large P politics. Uh, and, and I think that the governor is being completely consistent on this. He has said in his oath of office that he's going to stand up for the Constitution of the state of Missouri and the Constitution of the United States. And what he's standing up against is blatantly unconstitutional, any legal <laughs> Expert will tell you that. Well, let me I think, oh, I think go ahead. That, okay. I think there's more than one way to skin that cat, though, in terms of having a better system in place. But I think one of the more fascinating dynamics of this, too, is you see a governor who traditionally a governor 
supports members of his own party or at minimum just leaves them alone, right? I mean, we kind of have had both examples here in Missouri. In this case, you see a governor who's going after members of his own party. And I mean, the ads that we saw that weren't supposed, that we weren't supposed to see earlier this week, um, the attack ads going after folks of his own party, it just creates a whole different dynamic, which adds to more dysfunction in Jefferson City. Let me pitch an argument to you, Greg Keller. There's somebody I respect in this debate. It's, it's Carl Bearden. Mm -hmm. Carl Bearden was out actually winning tough seats in St. Charles County before that was fashionable for Republicans. He, he's definitely been on the tip of the spear of, of taking the state from blue to red. He makes the argument that you made that it, it lets people's names out. Well, I'm a member of the ACLU and the NRA, and if you want to protest in West Butler County, you probably ought to be on the other side of the gravel road. I've never had it happen. Does this really happen to people? I mean, why Absolutely. would you why would you be ashamed to support Governor Greitens? It, it, we saw this under the Obama administration time and time and time again. Obama and his cronies in Washington, D.C., specifically using the IRS to target organizations because they had the temerity to stand up for conservative values. They were targeted by the federal government. The IRS came calling. They searched through their files. They shut down their organizations. They refused to register them. This is real stuff, and it's been perpetrated very recently at the highest levels of government by but the Democratic Party. you know, United for Missouri as a conservative group without having to have their donor list public. You could shut that down if you're the government. Sure. Anyway. Well, what, what, the Democrat, what the Democrat Party has shown is that they will use government, the highest levers of government, all the way up to the White House to use organizations like the IRS to target these organizations. Now we're going to go ahead and give that same Democrat Party the opportunity to go after their donors too? Well, How does that Donald make J. Trump's president now, but what? let me ask you this question. Do you think at the end of the day they find a way to stop groups like the governor's dark money group, but not harm groups like United for Missouri? I, I don't see that there's going to be a change in, in this type of uh, campaign finance any time in the future. And I think if you look at the way the left has villainized folks like David Humphreys, a Missouri employer, someone that That's has true. tried to push a conservative agenda in this state and has just been villainized by the left, even for things that he's not even connected to, and they take each donor one by one and do this to them. Well, I, I think a, you can see why they want to be. He's a person that gives transparently, though. He does. I mean, you certainly could see it. It's, he does, it but you would see why it. others wouldn't want to participate with the way that they're treated. You know, Zan, you have protected speech. I mean, you're, it's completely protected to me. You, the right to keep it secret, I mean, there's a trade-off, correct? Politicians, there's money that goes into a politician's account. It's public. You can see it. There is. And, and the larger issue here is even bigger than campaign finance reform or any of that sort of stuff. It is, if you run on something and you talk about, I'm going to throw these corrupt people down the steps of the Capitol myself, and all of these members of my own party are corrupt, and then you are literally doing the very thing that you are accusing them of doing. I think if Democrats can make the issue about that, it's the blatant hypocrisy of you are using dark money to attack them for taking dark money. It's absurd. And I think the more you can make that the issue, the more you can get to the fact that this is what makes people sick about politics. Mm -hmm. They're tired of politicians just saying one thing to them and doing something completely different and hoping that we're not paying attention. Major, I think Eric Greitens is the epiphany, epiphany of people that were tired of politics and wanted to try something different. I think everyone knew he made it clear you knew he was outside this. He was not versed in government. And I think he's been wildly successful at it, except for maybe this. I mean, if, if it wasn't for this, what are people criticizing Eric Greitens about today? Well, the other thing is the the Mission Continues list, his charity that he was yeah. previously in charge of, of course, that came out. Uh, well, he denied in, during the campaign that he had used the donor list from the charity, and now he's since been uh, fined by the Ethics Commission for it. There are some real legal issues um, at play there, and somebody should probably look into that, maybe the Attorney General perhaps, um, to find out, you know, who created the list, which was, according to the metadata, created while he was still in charge over it, the mission continues. And um, was it him? Did he direct somebody to do it? Ho you know, hopefully not. Was it a staffer that was trying to help him out? But like, we still are not at the bottom of that. And again, it's another example of just sort of this do as I say, not as I do. I'm above, you know, the law that I think everybody else should. And I think that's where the ethics violation comes back to body. And the next time he launches into a corrupt career politician thing, I think folks probably don't, well, you ha the ethics laws are complicated and you have a violation yourself, right? My friends back home in Northeast Missouri are not going to follow a story about who <clears throat> owned a spreadsheet, when and where, or and they're not going to care about C4s or anything like that. They're going to want a governor that's moving around the state trying to move it forward and trying to fix problems. And that's what they see Governor Greitens is doing. Greg Keller, is it about ethics or is it about, can you make an argument of hypocrisy? I think that's the bigger thing. And I do think fundamentally folks care about hypocrisy. 
And if you've came out and said, I'm going to be the leader on ethics, to me, there's a, there's a way the story ends very well, and it's he's the leader on ethics, and he maybe steps aside from his. Well, bear in mind, you may, you, you may still get ethics reform done that may include some of the C4 uh, yeah. it, it, things as well, too. At the end of the day, you're going to have a popular governor who is going to have an incredible list of accomplishments. To your point, he's already done so. And you have a Democrat party that has absolutely zero bench in this state and very small likelihood of being able to raise the money to support a governor candidate in the first place. Let's do some predictions here. Do you predict that the Senate uh, takes a vote on dark money and does it pass? I, I predict that it does not pass. Do you think they get to a vote and does it pass? Conservatives will shoot it down. Let's get to a vote and pass. Uh, Republicans are in charge of everything, and they should do some sort of ethics reform, but I don't think it'll happen. You know, there's been an interesting case in Jeff City, though, where some of the Democrats have worked with the leadership in the, in the Senate to undercut some of the opposition side. So I, I think it may get to a vote. I don't, I just, I'm wondering who's the coalition of people that votes for dark money. What do you think happens? I agree with Mindy. It should, it should pass. It won't. Interesting. I, uh, I think you might be surprised if it gets to the House. Do they pass it? The governor wants them to, I guess. Oh, <laughs> what do you think? If it gets them back over the house, you think they pass it? I don't know. I think Senate. I think they get to a vote, and wherever it comes, I think the Senate goes back to passing laws. I think the Senate doesn't pass it, but if they do, I think the House has signaled that they're going to give it a pretty serious look. Yeah, I think I think the House may actually I, send it back. I, I think, think the General do. Assembly will pass some sort of ethics reform. How stupid would people be that oppose Eric Greitens to take this issue off the table, though, right? I mean, if you if there if, if you go back to without this issue. Eric Griden is on cloud nine. Mm -hmm. He's probably on cloud eight, to your point now, but I mean, right. geez, he's taking off anyway. With a minute left, Aaron Baker, who won the week? Scott Fitzpatrick, young leader in the Republican Party, leading us through a, a tough budget year and doing so, showing quite ease and doing it on time. If the session ends today, which it may, <laughs> he may be the person who had the best session of anybody in the entire legislature. I That's think. right. Who won the week? Todd Richardson, Speaker of the Missouri House of Representatives, yeah. ushers through the budget uh, in great form, also signals that he's going to look at running very seriously for state auditor, uh, which I think is a smart political move, and if he does, he'd be extremely difficult be to beat. Be a top-tier candidate. I, I can't think of anybody better the Republicans could put up. Does Can the Republicans help him get through a primary, or do you have to spend his money in the primary? I. I think you're already hearing a little bit of talk about a primary, but this is a guy who's going to be able to raise a tremendous amount of money. He's a very attractive candidate, has got a lot of things done in the House. I think he's going to be very difficult to beat. Minnie Mazur, who won the week? I think the first responder is helping the flood victims won the week. With nice. a, um... That's why everyone likes you. <laughs> yeah. But I would say uh, special also um, number two would be Sly James for getting over 100,000 Twitter followers this week. Who won the week? Yeah. Well, Mindy stole mine, so other yeah. than that, I'd have to say um, probably Gina Walsh, because she's, like Greg mentioned, the Democrats don't have strong numbers right now in the State House or State Senate. She is a well-respected on both sides of the aisle fighter for Democratic causes and values, so and I, think I will, she wins just about every week. I will say the newly bald Mike Searpoy won the week. He always accomplishes things other people don't even know are happening. And we will see you next week on This Week in Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics, brought to you by Spire and Sterling Bank.